This isn't the type of snow that you would create a snowball with. This is powdery snow. It's not packing snow. You're not going to be able to go outside and make a snowman, and that's because it is so cold. Now we can see the smoke plume right now from that Carolina forest wildfire. It is starting to shift to the east as winds are blowing to the west, and it is starting to pick up again on radar. This is the southern hemisphere, and that's why, if you notice, it looks very different from the hurricanes we're used to seeing when Ed and I are tracking something in studio here. It's because it's spinning differently. Differently. It is spinning clockwise. We're not seeing that smoke go high up into the atmosphere. It won't because we have colder air, so it's going to stay closer to the ground and it's a little harder to see today as well. And that's also because of that colder air. That isn't because there's not smoke. The fire is still ongoing. Well, in the summertime, often you see lightning like this occurring along the horizon line, especially at night. Some people call this heat lightning or dry lightning. The only thing is heat lightning is actually a myth, but we had really dry air today, dry vegetation as we are in a moderate drought across the area. On top of that, it was windy and it was warm, so all of those ingredients come together to create a risk for fires to not only spark, but spread very easily. The atmosphere is layered like a cake as you go down, looking at it like a 2D plane. So if we're talking about rain, we have snow falling from the cloud base, and then it hits a warmer layer where it melts into rain, and that stays in a warmer layer all the way to the ground. We have a flash flood warning in place now for parts of Robison and Bladen counties and that goes until 8 o'clock tonight. So this thunderstorm is really not moving that fast. It is adding more heavy rainfall over areas that have seen this over the past hour or so from the same storm. This is the view from our North Myrtle Beach camera. It is super foggy. You can barely make out the building. Tropical Storm W was named a tropical storm as of the 5 o'clock update today because its center is now more consolidated as it is moving over the Straits of Florida. It'll continue to move north westerly before taking a northerly turn tomorrow. We began the chase in Florence County Wednesday morning, assessing the atmosphere in the PD. This was the most flash flood emergencies issued in a single day since 2013, and this was all from Helene, a major catastrophic event in the region. Barrel and Milton, of course, resulting in tornado outbreaks, Francine hitting Louisiana, and then the Carolinas dealt with Helene and Debbie directly. Helene, obviously a catastrophic storm that many will remember for centuries and then there's Debbie which mostly impacted the PD and the Grand Strand briefly. You got to get it in cuz I to. mean Sunday you're going to get outside and it's going to be chilly or I, I missed it. That, I got so excited today. I ordered a 10 foot by 10 foot beach towel. They call it a beach blanket. That is massive. It's huge. It's like as big as the desk. So you're going to like set up a whole big beach it's setup. It's got stakes. There are severe thunderstorm warnings ahead and along this line. That's because it's just so windy. A lot of these are for tornado possible as well, and that's because a tornado can spin up very quickly in this line. You don't want to find an elevated surface like a table or a chair, and you don't want to find a snow drift that was blown by the wind. You want to find an area where it all looks very similar. Across the area, we are in a level two out of five risk from the storm prediction center that is everywhere in yellow and the highest hazards that we're looking at with that severe weather tomorrow are damaging wind gusts and a brief tornado or two are possible. It's going to be quite the roller coaster. Enjoy the 70s while they're here. I mean, you got to go to the beach. You got to get outside. Call this the faux spring earlier. Exactly. <laughs> it is because second winter is returning. Now, did you turn the AC on? I did, you but did. I run hot. My AC has been on for weeks at this point. Yeah. Some studies do show that that wind shear is likely to increase over a majority of the Atlantic. So what happens when a hurricane encounters this area of high wind shear? Well, that hurricane moves into it. It starts to break apart and then eventually it dissipates. I was outside playing with my kids. I mean, my dogs were sweating. My kids were sweating. I was sweating. It was hotter than a $2 pistol. It really was. I mean, you don't usually think that you can be outside tanning in February, but <laughs> It is South Carolina. Anything goes, I guess. But we did also break some daily high temperature records because of that warmth today. So we're watching a stationary front offshore of the southeast. As it dissipates, it could spawn an area of low pressure that has a chance to develop subtropical or tropical characteristics this weekend into the beginning of next week. 
Well, tomorrow morning starts with some dense fog across the area. This looking at 5 a.m. tomorrow. Fog will continue to stick around for much of the morning, burning off as we head into really the 10 or the 11 o'clock hours. So that fog is going to be around for quite some time, but we'll make way to a mix of sunny clouds for New Year's Eve day with temperatures much warmer than normal for this time of year. We'll see the upper 60s to low 70s across the area and a very small chance for rain with another incoming cold front. So let's time that out as we head through Tuesday. We're likely to stay dry. Not everyone is going to see rain, but those that do, it'll be a light shower moving by pretty quickly as we head into the evening. Our chances are a little higher across parts of the area, but as we head into the evening hours, small rain chances sticking around moving off by 10 or 11. So by midnight, we are dry with skies clearing for New Year's Eve. Temperatures will be dropping too. We'll be in the mid to upper 40s by 2 a.m on New Year's Eve. By the time the ball drops, we'll see some moonlight with mostly clear skies and temperatures in the upper 40s to low 50s. So New Year's Day, it'll be a little chillier on the back side of that front. We'll see temperatures in the upper 40s at 10 by 1 o'clock. We're in the low 50s. Lots of sunshine is in store and by 4 o'clock our highs that day will be in the upper 50s too low 60s, so near normal for this time of year, but colder air is still on the way yet. We have another dry cold front that'll come through Wednesday night into Thursday morning. Temperatures are now chillier Thursday and Friday, and then another dry cold front comes through Friday into Saturday, bringing temperatures into the 40s for highs on Saturday and a cold night Friday and especially Saturday night for the first weekend of 2025. So your 10 day forecast for the Grand Strand a small shower chances around for our last day of 2024 and then 2025 opens up with a lot of sunshine and near normal for this time of year. A cold night Wednesday night into Thursday morning. Some frost is expected. You'll notice our overnights are going to stay consistently pretty chilly as we head into the weekend. Small chance for rain appears to start the first full week of January. Your 10 day forecast inland. We are clear this weekend. Lots of sunshine is expected, but you'll notice temperatures are cold Saturday night 24 for that low. We warm up just a little bit before that front on Monday into Tuesday and then we're cold again in the 40s at the end of the 10 day period. Climate change impacts more than just the weather and the climate. Like a butterfly effect. One of those things is mosquitoes. Mosquitoes need warm, humid weather conditions to flourish, and as human-induced climate change causes the planet to slowly but surely warm, the period of time when mosquitoes are active and swarming you is lengthening. Dr. Shannon Ledoux is a senior scientist at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, and she tells me that as warmer conditions and increased precipitation impact areas due to the changing climate, there's more time for mosquitoes to stay active and grow in population. A lot of the things we talk about with climate change that don't involve big storm disasters are really hard for people to see how it might in influence their daily life. But everybody's been bitten by mosquitoes and everybody has, uh, certainly in the eastern U.S., had that week or two weeks of the summer where you just can't go outside. Mosquitoes are too problematic. Mosquitoes also thrive in litter collecting and pooling water, such as discarded tires and bottle caps. This means litter and other human created habitats assist the growth of mosquito populations and nuisance days. They are pretty good at optimizing habitat that humans create, which means they're a lot closer to humans. Um, and thus more likely to bite humans. And so that's um, that's playing out kind of in parallel in parallel to the climate change. Taking a look at regions across the US, the Southeast has the most mosquito days of any region per year, making up 60% of the year, followed by the Deep South with half of the year being mosquito days. Now, since 1979, mosquito days in Myrtle Beach and Florence have been growing due to the changing climate. 21 additional days in Myrtle Beach, 10 additional days in Florence, and this will continue under the changing climate. With more mosquito days and more activity, other concerns become evident. A handful of the mosquito species that bite humans are known vectors of pathogens. Um, in the United States, that's predominantly viral pathogens. Most people have heard of things like West Nile virus. Increasingly, we're seeing uh, emergence of things like dengue virus at the southern, um, southern limit of the United States, where um, 
there aren't really strong winter conditions limiting specific species of mosquitoes. These disease worries are becoming more and more common in urban areas, which means more of a chance for a viral human outbreak. Your next question may be, why not eliminate mosquitoes altogether? Well, it's not for a lack of trying. We have tried since you know, human history was recorded to get rid of even the few species that we know are problematic and never been successful. Um, but we do know that blanket pesticides and adulticides often kill a lot of the things that eat mosquitoes or compete with mosquitoes. Some of the ones that don't bite humans compete with the, the problem vectors during those juvenile phases. And one of the reasons we have species that are doing so well in cities right now is because they've been able to establish in habitats where there's no competition and no predation. Dr. Ledoux says the best way to protect yourself from mosquitoes is by managing water and standing water in your yard. However, since mosquitoes can fly, it only takes one neighbor not managing water ponding objects to cause an influx of mosquitoes in your neighborhood. For Climate Carolinas, I'm meteorologist Jenna Warner. Flight times, routes, turbulence, aircraft design, they're all changing because of human-caused climate change. The Earth's atmosphere is layered like an onion, and each one of these layers is changing in different ways. Dr. Paul Williams is a professor of atmospheric science at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom, and he's known for his research on climate change and air travel. His work on clear air turbulence is changing how the aviation industry forecasts and operates. It's kind of got a magical property or mystical property about it because it's invisible, and that's why we call it clear air turbulence. You can't see it. Uh, not even the radar on board an aircraft can see it. It's generated by a, a powerful air current called the jet stream predominantly, which can blow very quickly in the upper atmosphere, and it can become unstable. Something called a wind shear instability is the technical name for it. And all that means is that when the jet stream uh, gets too fast, when the wind shear within the jet stream gets too strong, it can break down into turbulence. And the wind shear is 15% stronger today than it was before the era of satellites. And that's clearly because of human caused climate change, changing the temperatures, and because the temperatures and the winds are very closely linked together by atmospheric laws, if you like, you can't change the temperatures without also changing the winds. And that's why the jet stream is changing. Warmer air means planes generate less lift, creating more challenges at takeoff. And it means lightning is forecast to become more frequent. Headwinds and tailwinds are changing flight routes and journey times, and the aviation industry is having to adapt. Williams says today's airplanes were designed based on a turbulence model from the 1960s. Now, of course, the atmosphere has changed since the 1960s. It's got a lot more turbulence in it. And I think there are questions there about whether the current certification standards um, are still correct. Clear air turbulence is forecast every day using weather modeling and calculations. So while this is an invisible force, pilots can plan the smoothest flight routes using turbulence forecasts. The help these forecasts lend to planning flight routes and times will prove invaluable as turbulence increases over time. But even with the best forecasts, flyers will still experience more turbulence. Of course, no one is ever injured by light, weak turbulence, but nervous flyers hate it. Um, and so there's rightly some anxiety there around what the future holds. But even for people who don't mind a bit of turbulence, the, you know, the really severe turbulence that does injure people and hospitalize people, and sadly, sometimes fatally. Because of Dr. Williams' research, some airlines like Southwest Airlines are changing their food and beverage services to prevent the danger increased turbulence poses. For Climate Carolinas, I'm meteorologist Jenna Warner.